The simple statistics in this table give a picture of the vast disparities among the different regions of this planet. If you look at the last line in the US, the computers for 1,000 people, there are 810 computers for 1,000 people. Look at South Asia, 22 computers for 1,000 people. If you look at internet users per 1,000 persons in the US, it's 740, as opposed to 46 in South Asia. So please note that the digital device is not a figment of people's imagination. It's real, it exists, and can be pictorially depicted as follows. If you look at the outdoor class in Africa and the computer class in Europe, you can immediately see the difference. Or the house in Malawi and the MIT Media Lab in the US, this comes home very, very significant. But the divides are not just about technology. The regional, class, gender, and ethnic divides in the digital world have been well documented by many studies. The access to educational technology in terms of gender has been a well-reviewed subject in many studies have found that the gender differential exists even in developed countries in terms of accessing and resourcing ICT infrastructure. Similarly, the digital divide also has a geographical and racial dimension. As these dimensions of the digital divide get reflected in the OER, is it possible that OER can become a resource for education and learning, a genuine resource? This may partly explain the latent resistance to OERs in some contexts. The other explanation may relate to who owns and controls the OER networks. And I'd like to quote the full quotation from Manuel Castells. I've just given a bit here on the slide. And what he says is, there is a fundamental form of exercising power that is common to all networks, exclusion from the network. However, because the key strategic networks are global, there is one form of exclusion, thus of power, that is pervasive in a world of networks. To include everything valuable in the global while excluding the devalued local. There are citizens of the world living in the space of flows, and that might include all of us, versus the locals, that means the really marginalized, who live in the space of places. Because space in the network society is configured around the opposition between the space of flows, which is global, and the space of places, which is local, the spatial structure of our society is a major source of the structuration of power relationships. In his analysis of the network society, Castells has elaborated the network making power, which operates on the basis of two mechanisms. The ability to constitute program and reprogram networks, and the ability to connect and ensure cooperation. Many important stakeholders of education may be far beyond this network making power due to regional, gender, class, and ethnic factors. It is obvious that Africa, South Asia, and Latin America may have lit limited potential in network making power. These types of power play a major role in the inclusion and exclusion of various stakeholders. It is perhaps because of the, these inequalities that institutions and individuals from the global south have hitherto had a limited role in OER creation and dissemination. OER requires social movements which will result in institutional change. The present debates in OER are too focused on technology and there is rarely any discussion on issues such as stakeholder engagement and the politics of power. OER require a process-oriented approach in which stakeholders and citizens come together and articulate their views and influence institutional change. How will this institutional change come about? The process-oriented approach for OER could be perceived in the context of domestication as proposed by Silverstone, Hirsch, and Morley in 1992. They argue that technology defines, as well as is defined by communities that adopt or challenge it. 
The domestication theory propounded by Silverstone et al. could be extended because they did it, you know, in terms of how technology is used in the household economy. We can extend this to the community, to the national and international levels, and especially for OER to become a truly open resource in which every type of stakeholder could participate. And this table actually visualizes that project. For example, the first stage is appropriation, which means access to the appliances, the technology, the communication networks, but not just to those, but also access in terms of social, access in terms of class, gender, and ethnicity. So we are talking about wider democratic values here. Localization, how we can actually adapt the OERs to the social, political, and cultural values of different contexts. In cooperation, how every stakeholder should actually interact with the OERs and then incorporate them into their own educational goals, not into somebody else's educational goals. And finally, the stakeholder is encouraged to look beyond the community and reach out to global communities, thereby also influencing the structure and functions of OERs. Domestication is crucial for various stakeholders to get involved, influence, and be influenced by OERs. It is only then that the, this can become a mass movement. And when it becomes a mass movement, then it can actually have a real impact in the developing countries. Finally, a participatory approach is again very important as part of the governance of OER. Technology is de definitely one of the influencing factors in participation. However, by itself, it would not be in a position to stimulate the involvement of various stakeholders. Many educational st institutions still have traditional governance structures and teacher-centered pedagogic models. The OER initiative requires a learner-centered and decentralized approach. There is then a basic contradiction between the centralized and decentralized institutional models. Such contradictions can be addressed through an effective governance framework which would help to strengthen the participation of all types of stakeholders. Now, if you look at the trends in the last 10 years, and I'll give you some of the examples from our own experience. 10 years ago, there was a uh, pact between the African Union, which has 53 states, and the Indian government. So it was a very top kind of level decision. India had EduSat, which was a satellite solely dedicated for education. And the, uh, the decision was to use the footprint of EduSat in Africa for education and training in health. Now, here, the whole decision was based on technology. Technology came first here. And it was a top-down approach, therefore not that sustainable. The second phase is the African Virtual University that many of you have heard of. The World Bank set it up in Nairobi. And what was being done is that engineering courses, mathematic courses from North American universities were being brought through this African Virtual University using teleconferencing, very high technology, for African institutions. And there was a complete rejection of that. So here the focus was on content primarily and not so much on what actually people needed. And then finally, the third generation in the last 10 years is the virtual university. We've learned from the experience of these other experts uh, and started with a bottom-up approach in which we've put the people and the learning first. And we hope that it's still too early, this is only about four or five years old, to actually gauge the impact and show evidence for it. But we hope that this will be a more sustainable mod model which will help us to convert the divide into a dividend. For example, we must place the emphasis on people rather than on technologies. We can look at knowledge as a social product which emerges as an interface between the machine, the individual, and society, and learning as a process of knowledge creation so that it's not just consumers of knowledge, but consumers, there's a kind of interchange between the production and